Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Even though it's called second or two Corinthians in our Bibles, there are multiple clues within this letter that it's not the second thing he ever wrote to the church of ancient Corinth. Paul started this Jesus community in Corinth some time ago on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the story in the book of Acts chapter 18. And after moving on, Paul got a report that things were not going well there. So he wrote the letter that we call 1 Corinthians to correct these problems. And it appears that many in the church rejected Paul's teaching in that letter and rebelled against his authority. And so we learn in this letter that Paul had followed up in person with what he calls the painful visit. And after that, he sent a letter which he says was written with anguish and tears. And so after all these measures, most, but not all, of the Corinthians realized their arrogance and they apologized to Paul. They wanted to reconcile. And so Paul wrote this letter to assure them of his love and commitment. The letter's been designed with three main sections, each addressing a distinct topic. So Paul first finalizes his reconciliation with the Corinthians. Then in chapters 8 and 9, he addresses the topic of forgotten generosity. And in the final chapters, Paul challenges the remaining Corinthians who still reject him. Let's dive in and you'll see how it all works. So Paul opens up by thanking the God of all mercy and comfort who brought peace and encouragement to him and the Corinthians during this time of division and dispute. He acknowledges that things have been tense since this painful visit and he makes clear he's forgiven them. He wants an open and honest relationship. But why had they rejected Paul in the first place? Well, we discover later in this letter that the Corinthians had disregarded Paul as a leader. He was poor. He earned a meager living through manual labor. He was under constant persecution and suffering. He was often homeless. And to top it off, he wasn't a very impressive public speaker. And so once the Corinthians were exposed to other more wealthy, impressive Christian leaders, they started to think less of Paul. They were actually ashamed of him. So Paul responds first by showing that their elevation of these leaders simply because of their wealth and eloquence is a betrayal of Jesus. It shows a totally distorted value system. True Christian leadership, Paul says, is not about status or self-promotion. Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as captive slaves to King Jesus who's leading them on a procession of triumph. Paul's job isn't to be impressive, but rather to point people to the one who is. Jesus. He then alludes to the recent demand of the Corinthians that he provide some letters of recommendation to prove his authority and credentials. And this is ridiculous to Paul. Their church wouldn't even exist if he hadn't started it. And so he says they are his proof of genuine leadership. They are his letter of recommendation. He cleverly quotes from the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying that God's spirit has written his letter of recommendation on their hearts as his new covenant people. The Corinthians shouldn't need any more proof than that. Now the mention of the new covenant, it leads Paul into a long comparison between the old covenant between God and Israel that was mediated by Moses and the new covenant between God and the Corinthians mediated by Jesus and the Spirit. The old covenant made at Mount Sinai, it was truly glorious. It made Moses himself shine with God's glory, but that glory eventually faded. Not to mention the fact that the laws of that covenant were ineffective at truly transforming Israel. But the new covenant, by comparison, is even more glorious because the resurrected Jesus is the very glory of God and he lives on forever. And it's his spirit that's now transforming people to become more faithful just like Jesus himself. Now this all sounds amazing. I mean, who doesn't want to share in God's own glory? But Paul goes on to show how the paradox of the cross turns upside down the Corinthians' ideas of glory and success. After all, Jesus' glorious exaltation as king took place through his suffering, execution, and death. On the cross, Jesus revealed God's salvation. He died for the sins of the world to reconcile people to God. But the cross does even more. It reveals God's character. He's a being of utter self-giving, suffering love that seeks the well-being of others. The cross also reveals a new cruciform way of life. And Paul's goal is that his life and ministry imitates the cross. So although his apostolic career has been marked by humility, suffering, by poverty, it was all to serve the Corinthians. And so when they disapprove of Paul's poverty and suffering, they disapprove of Jesus too. Paul's way of life and leadership is actually the proof that he authentically represents the crucified and risen Jesus. Paul really wants to reconcile with the Corinthians, but he won't let things lie until they've been transformed and embrace this upside-down paradox of the cross. 
After this passionate appeal, Paul moves on to address the topic of forgotten generosity. So the Jewish Christians back in Jerusalem, they had fallen into poverty due to a famine. And Paul was raising money among the new churches that he started, full of mostly non-Jews. They would all send a relief gift as a symbol of their unity in the Messiah, Jesus. And so many of his churches, they were thrilled to give. But the Corinthians,